My name is Kate McIntosh, I'm the Executive Director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights here at UCLA School of Law, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this panel discussion on the treatment of prisoners of war, new legal developments, and the example of the Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh conflict. The event today is co-sponsored by the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA, by the International and Comparative Law Programme at UCLA Law, and by the Armenian Bar Association. And on behalf of all of our UCLA co-sponsors, I'd like to start by acknowledging our presence at UCLA on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. So today's event was initiated in response to the ongoing issue of Armenian prisoners of war detained by Azerbaijan in the recent conflict. To help us understand the legal obligations concerning prisoners of war, we're delighted to have Professor Julia Grignon, an expert in international humanitarian law or the laws of war, who will open by giving us an overview of the legal framework applicable to prisoners of war. For students and legal scholars in the audience, this is of particular interest because the International Committee of the Red Cross just last year issued its updated commentary on this law, providing the first updated explanation of the meaning of the terms in the Third Geneva Convention since the 1950s. Following Professor Grignon's presentation of the law, we are honoured to invite the newly appointed Human Rights Ombudsman of the Republic of Artsakh, Mr. Gegen Stepanian, to outline the factual situation currently ongoing with regard to the detention and treatment of Armenian prisoners of war. Finally, Jess Peake, Assistant Director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights, will give an overview of reporting on this issue by independent human rights observers and consider possible avenues for international action. We have a short session of just one hour, so I've asked the speakers to stick strictly to time so that we can accommodate questions from the audience at the end of the session. So I'll turn first to Professor Grignon. Julia Grignon is an Associate Professor of the Faculty of Law at Laval University in Quebec, where she teaches international humanitarian law, international human rights law and international refugee law. She's one of the co-directors of the Clinic of International Criminal and Humanitarian Law, as well as a co-founder of the Interdisciplinary Centre for Research on Africa and the Middle East. Professor Kainio is currently conducting an individual research project about the extraterritorial application of international human rights law in the context of external military operations. And she holds a partnership development, Let's Dare IHL, Promotion and Strengthening of International Humanitarian Law, a Canadian contribution, both funded by the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you very much for this invitation to speak uh, in this panel. I am particularly happy to have an opportunity to engage uh, in this topic. Uh, it is indeed rather rare to have an opportunity to speak about prisoner of wars or POWs, simply because people with that status are only a few worldwide. The task that has been assigned to me today is to present the legal framework applicable to POWs, including the updated commentary of the ICRC, as Kate uh, just mentioned. The legal framework applicable to prisoners of war is encompassed into the Third Geneva Convention of 1949 relative to the treatment of POWs that remains the most comprehensive instrument for the protection of prisoners of war in international law today. The purpose of this convention is to ensure that all such prisoners are treated humanly and held in decent conditions, regardless of which side they belong to. Regarding the commentary of the ICRC, this is a doctrinal tool that interprets each of the provisions of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and of their additional protocols of 1977. Initially drafted right after the adoption of these instruments, they are currently being updated within the ICRC because I said by, by the commentary itself, and I quote, as all international law, the conventions are living instruments and they must be interpreted and applied in light of contemporary circumstances. Given the evolution of warfare in the last 70 years, this updated commentary is most welcome since it gives a refreshed interpretation of the Geneva Conventions and among them of Geneva Convention 3, the commentary of which is available online since spring 2020, as you just said, uh, Kate. 
I will deal with each of these aspects, the legal framework and the commentary, one after the other. But before uh, digging into the legal framework itself, I would like to underline that the notion of prisoner of war is one of those in international humanitarian law that impedes a full merging of the law of international armed conflict and of the law of non-international armed conflict. The legal classification of prisoner of war only exists in international armed conflict. Yet the situation between Armenia and Azerbaijan classifies as an international armed conflict, that is when at least two states are opposing in armed fighting. There is a tendency today to consider that the law applicable in international armed conflict and the law applicable to non-international armed conflict are or should be all the same, since there is no reason to be less or more protected because the classification made of the situation of violence that affects people in need of protection, but some legal notions prevent from doing so. This is the case, for example, for the notion of occupation, the notion of grave breaches, and precisely the notion of POWs. Members of non-state armed groups or people that have taken part in hostilities in non-international armed conflict do not have POW status when they fall into enemy hands. And additionally, there remains still much controversy about the legal basis for interning people in non-international armed conflict, whereas internment is very well regulated in international armed conflicts. Furthermore, there is still no choice but to maintain the distinction between people who are entitled to prisoner of war status and others, simply because of the privilege attached to the combatant status, from which the POW status is derived. International humanitarian law is part of international law, which is drafted and adopted by states, yet no state in the world is ready to recognize this privilege to entities other than regular armed forces. These precisions made, let's first have a look to uh, the legal framework applicable to POWs. To be in the hands of the enemy, that means being more vulnerable and being more at risk of ill treatments. The first convention protecting POWs is the Convention of 1929, which followed the First World War, a war that showed that there was an urgent need for specific protection for this category of people. At the time of the First World War, there was no specific convention, but there was a high number of members of the many armed forces involved in the conflict that was captured and held in detention for the duration of the war, therefore without specific protection. Spontaneously, up to 400 women gathered in a museum in Geneva and worked at identifying their location and at making a link with their families and at coordinating the sending of parcels and messages and of belongings of soldiers killed in action or who had died while in captivity. They set up a Central Prisoners of War Agency, which is known today as the Central Tracing Agency and which continues to help prisoners to stay in contact with their relatives. In 1949, together with the other three conventions, which constitute still today the fundamental basis of IHL, the, 29, uh, so, sorry, the 1929 convention was updated and has become the third Geneva Convention relate, relative to prisoners of war. This convention is the legal framework to POW and has been complemented by some provisions of uh, additional pro protocol one on that topic. And some of these provisions are of customary international humanitarian law. It says who is a prisoner of war and how they should be treated according to their status. In order to give uh, an overview of the content of the legal framework, I will first recall who is entitled to POW status, what happens in case of doubt, and what distinguishes someone who is held under the POW status and someone who is detained under another ground. So who is entitled to prisoner of war status? Only persons that fail into the category of combatants in the legal sense, are entitled to prisoner of war status when they fall in enemy hands. 
Therefore, to know who is a prisoner of war, one has first to know who is a combatant in international armed conflict. Article 4 of Geneva Convention 3, complemented by Article 43 of Additional Protocol 1, say who is a combatant. There are several categories, but to sum up, first, a member of the armed forces of a party to an international armed conflict, respecting the obligation to distinguish himself or herself from the civilian population, is entitled to the prisoner of war status. A member, secondly, a member of another armed group belonging to a party to an international armed conflict, fulfilling as a group the four following conditions, operating under responsible common, wearing a fixed distinctive sign, carrying arms openly and respecting IHL, plus individually respecting the obligation to distinguish himself or herself from the civilian population, is entitled to the prisoner of war status. Regarding the loss of protection, combatants have an obligation to respect international humanitarian law, which includes distinguishing themselves from the civilian population. If they violate IHL, they must be punished. But they do, they do not lose their combatant status, and if captured by the enemy, they remain entitled to prisoner of war status, except if they have violated their individual obligation to distinguish themselves. What happens now in case of doubt? Article 5 of Geneva Convention 3 states that if an act of belligerency has been committed, and if not, if not, there is a presumption of being a civilian. So if an act of belligerency has been committed, a person that is captured by the enemy shall enjoy the protection of the Geneva Convention 3 until such time as their status has been determined by a competent tribunal. Now that the definition of who is a combatant and therefore who is a POW, what about the protection that they, afford, they are afforded to? In, a, in other words, what distinguishes someone who is held under the POW status and someone who is detained under another ground? It is important here to understand that the main differences between persons entitled to POW status and other categories of persons deprived of their liberty relies on their status not on their treatments. In terms of status, the differences are significant. However, in terms of treatment, they are not. So first, in terms of status, I would like to spot two main differences. The first one is about prosecutions. The internment of POW is a preventive, not a punitive measure. It prevents captured soldiers from returning to the battlefield. Internment aims at curtailing their movements and is not intended as a punishment. For a combatant, the mere participation in hostilities is not subject to, to judicial prosecution. This is the combatant immunity. But again, violations of IHL amounting as war crimes, for example, must be prosecuted. But in sum, no prosecution for the mere fact of having taken part in hostilities for prisoners of war. Whereas a detainee has to be prosecuted, may be condemned and may have a sentence to serve. Regarding now the second main uh, difference, the end of captivity. According to Geneva Convention 3, the convention applies from the time combatants fall into the power of the enemy and until their final release and repatriation. Since POWs are only detained to stop them from taking part in hostilities, they have to be released and repatriated when they are unable to participate. That is, during the conflict for health reasons, and of course, as soon as active hostilities have ended. Whereas a detainee will be released 
after having served his or her sentence, and this may be long after the cessation of hostilities, for example. So that was for the status. Now, in terms of treatment, the standards are roughly the same for POW and any other person deprived of his or her liberty, especially given the convergence of IHL and IHRL in this area. There is, however, still some provisions that are very specific to POWs, that is to soldiers held in captivity. But first, for um, the basic treatments, they are identical to any category of people, as I said. The basic principles underlie all the four Geneva Conventions. They rely on the respect for the life and dignity of the individual in situations of armed conflict. Those who suffer during armed conflict must be aided, protected, and cared for. That is what underlies IHL as a whole. People must, in all circumstances, be, be treated humanly without, without any adverse distinction funding on race, color, religion, or faith, sex, birth, wealth, or any similar criteria. Regarding POWs, the third convention recalls that they must be treated humanly including with respect for their persons and their honor, and protected against acts of violence, intimidation, insults, public curiosity, and physical or mental torture. All of this is very similar in any body of law applicable to deprivation of liberty, be it during or not armed conflict. On another hand, some provision of uh, Geneva Convention 3 remain specific to POW status and cannot be re replicated as such to other categories of people deprived of their liberty during armed conflicts. For example, the provisions regarding transfers. I don't enter into uh, too many details here in order to stick to the time that has been allocated to me, but I underline that Article 12.2 and some other provisions elaborate on the conditions of transfer. Mainly, prisoners of war may only be transferred by the detaining power to a power which is a party to the convention, and after the detaining power has satisfied itself of the willingness and ability of such transferry power to apply the convention. Another specificity regarding the treatment of uh, prisoners of wars, comparing to other categories of people deprived of their liberty, may be found in Article 17 of Geneva Convention 3 regarding their questioning. Indeed, in addition to the fact that POWs, like anybody else, whatever his or her status is, must not be subjected to torture or ill treatment, Article 17 provides that every prisoner of war, when, questioning, que, sorry, when questioned on the subject, is bound to give only his or her surname, first names and rank, date of birth, and army, regimental, personal, or serial number, or failing this, equivalent information. And that in order to benefit from the privileges accorded to his or her rank or status. Geneva Convention 3 provides and is very careful for the fact that POW must be treated with due regard to their rank, which is obviously a specificity for people belonging to armed forces. An entire chapter of Geneva Convention 3 is dedicated to that aspect. Another uh, provision which is interesting is about the posting of the convention. Article 41, uh, requires that in every camp the text of the convention and its annexes shall be posted in the prisoner's own language at places where all may read them. Finally, among other provisions very specific to prisoners of war, I would like to end this overview by pointing out that escape is defined and in a detailed manner in GC3, be it successful or unsuccessful. So now, uh, turning to what are the benefits of the updated commentary regarding uh, Geneva Convention 3. First, I would like to underline that what I can say about the updated commentary 
is to be understood from my academic perspective. I have contributed to the commentary of GC3 as an external expert, and I am currently supervising a team of students producing, in, producing it in French, but I am not an ICRC staff. Therefore, what I am about to say is an understanding or a reading of parts of the new commentary, but not an exhaustive presentation of it from an ICRC perspective. Regarding the new development, regarding um, POWs, here are some uh, selected highlights, and here again, I read uh, the commentary itself. First highlight regarding women. As a product of their time, some of the walls of the conventions are articulated in terms that do not meet today's standards. For example, the prohibition of sexual violence is construed as an attack on a woman's honor and as a violation of family rights instead of a violence to women's physical and psychological integrity. The updated commentary thus analyzes the specific needs of women interned as prisoners of war, the perspective of contemporary practice and legal requirements being taken into account. Second so highlight regarding uh, children. As stated in the commentary, today the issue of uh, recruitment and use of children in armed forces is regulated in other treaties. Although most states now employ fewer persons under the age of 18, 18 in active military service, a detaining power may still find itself responsible for children in prisoner of war camps, either because the state still has children serving in its armed forces, or because they were born in the camp or are in some way affiliated with or related to other captured persons. Children in the hands of detaining power are owed special protection because they are particularly vulnerable and have a distinct set of developmental and health needs. Third and final uh, highlight, the interplay between international human, humanitarian law and international, sorry, the interplay between international humanitarian law and the interplay um, with uh, international human rights law. Even if when explaining its methodology, the ICRC writes that references to human rights instruments have been included to provide practitioners with further information on a given topic when such instruments contain useful clarification or guidance, the, consist the consistency with which this has been done is to me questionable. Obviously, there is a major difference between IHL and IHRL on the matter, since humanitarian law provides for the internment of enemy personnel who, cl who classify as POW based solely on that status and without court review of the lawfulness of internment, which differs fundamentally from IHRL. But then, once in captivity, the tremendous development of standards applicable to people deprived of their liberty in the fields of IHRL is not reflected as it should be in the updated com uh, commentaries. Some refer to the Mandela rules for the treatment of prisoners, and among the sources referred to, we can find the Beijing rules for the administration of juvenile justice. But these are a few references only, and most of the time, where, while reading the commentary, we can notice the language of IHRL, but without any refer reference to it. And I think this is a pity. So here is what I could say in 20 minutes regarding the legal framework applicable to POWs and the updated commentary. I thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to discuss this further uh, during the Q&A period. Thank you. Wonderful, Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you for managing to set out that complex body of law in such a clear and accessible way. And I think it's very helpful for this conversation to understand that these standards do exist, and that they've been revitalised with the commentary, and we can talk about how we can use them in the current context. Let me hand over to Gegem Stepanian now, who was elected Human Rights Ombudsman of the Republic of Artsakh on March the 25th, 2021. From December 2016 to May 2020, Mr. Stepanian served as assistant to the President of the Parliament of Artsakh. 
Mr. Stepanian obtained his BA in International Affairs from the Yerevan State University and his Master's in Political Science and International Affairs from the American University of Armenia. Uh, Gegan, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizations for this uh, event and for this opportunity to speak about the mistreatment of Armenian prisoners of war. Uh, this issue is uh, very important for Armenian public now and it is on the uh, top uh, public and political agenda, both in Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, previous speaker presented the legal framework for the protection of POWs, and I would say that uh, almost all of the regulations stipulated by the international law concerning the treatment of POWs and civilian captives have been and currently are being violated by Azerbaijan. Uh, I, I will uh, use the term captives in order to include both the uh, prisoners of war and uh, the civilian detainees. Uh, the Human Rights Ombudsman uh, of Artsakh, uh, the uh, National Human Rights Organization Institute, uh, have, uh, has initiated a fact-finding mission during uh, the 44-day war. And together with the Human Rights Defender of the Republic of Armenia, we have uh, prepared six close reports on the inhuman treatment of Armenian uh, captives. The reports are closed due to the sensitive content, but we provide the reports to the organizations who are investigating this issue. The reports include photos and video links to the materials that were published in the Azerbaijani social media depicting the degrading treatment uh, by the Azerbaijani side of the Armenian captives. These facts have been documented not only by us, but also by a number of international human rights organizations, such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and others. During the war, Azerbaijani forces abused Armenian prisoners of war and civilian detainees, subjecting them to cruel and degrading treatment and torture either when they were captured during their transfer from one place to another or while in custody at detention facilities. The crimes committed by Azerbaijan against the uh, captives, Armenian captives, include the violations of the international law that prohibit actions against the life and physical integrity of captives, particularly prohibition of all kinds of murder, mutilation, cruelty, and torture. From the video spread on Azerbaijani networks, we have documented numerous cases of Azeri armed forces beheading Armenian captives or killing them by shooting at a short distance. Numerous cases of willful killings were reported, especially among elderly people who did not manage to evacuate from their places of residence and were later captured by other Azerbaijani soldiers and uh, killed by them. We have registered at least 40 such cases, and we have also prepared a report on, uh, on this topic, and we presented it to the relevant international organizations. I would like to uh, mention one case, the case of Arsen Garakhanyan, a 40-year-old man from Hadrut region of Artsakh. Arsen Garakhanyan and his father were captured by Azerbaijan at the same time. Azerbaijan passed information about his father, about the detention of his father, to the Red Cross, but not about Arsene. His father, Sasha Garakhanyan, was repatriated in December 2020, and the family was waiting for the repatriation of their son. But uh, Arsene was killed and his body was handed over in January 2021. And at the time the body was transferred, a forensic examination showed that Arsene had been killed four days earlier, and there were many traces of torture on the body. This is just, uh, just one example, and there they are a lot of such examples. Uh, also, I would like to uh, note that during our meetings with, uh, with former POWs, they spoke of numerous examples of uh, ill treatment, torture, and inhuman attitude towards them. They all uh, described prolonged and repeated beatings. One described being prodded with a sharp metal rod. Another said he was subjected to electric shocks. Uh, and one was repeatedly burned with a cigarette lighter. The men were held in degrading conditions, given very little water and little to no food in the initial days of their detention. 
They were kept in places uh, not intended for captives, where the most basic conditions were not observed. The Azerbaijani side also hindered the contacts of the Armenian captives with the Red Cross organization, often creating artificial obstacles. The accounts of torture and ill treatment proved that Armenian POWs and civilian detainees still in Azerbaijan are at risk of further abuse and killings because the Azerbaijani authority does not ensure the protection of their rights to which they are entitled under international human rights and humanitarian law, including, including freedom from torture and ill treatment. The representatives of the Azerbaijani armed forces also during the war and after carried out actions against the dignity of the Armenian POWs and the civilian detainees, in particular, insulting and humiliating them. The videos depict Azerbaijani captors slapping, kicking, and making them to kill the Azerbaijani flag. Uh, Prize Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev uh, swear at Armenian authorities and the Armenian Prime Minister and declare that Nagorno-Karabakh is Azerbaijan. Uh, compelling Armenians to repeat their words, uh, usually of a degrading nature, filming it and uploading the videos to social networks is a widespread practice of the Azerbaijani military. These actions were applauded by the Azerbaijani society, which speaks for itself. In most uh, of the videos, the captors did not even hide their faces, because, uh, which means that they did not even fear being uh, held accountable for that. The most recent vivid example of the outrage upon personal dignity of Armenian captives is the demonstration of their mannequins in the recently opened so-called Park of Military Trophy in Baku. The people who made those mannequins say that they were instructed to make the ugliest mannequin they have ever made. Uh, six months later of the war, the Azerbaijani society continues to show disrespectful attitude towards Armenians and especially Armenian captives. Another serious problem is that Azerbaijan hides the real number of uh, Armenian captives. Azerbaijan does not provide information on the number of prisoners of war and civilian detainees, not only to the Armenian and Arsakhi side, but also to the international organizations, including the International Committee of the Red Cross, as well as the Russian peacekeepers. The Azerbaijani side so far has confirmed 72 captives, but we are convinced that the number of captives is more than is presented by Azerbaijan because during our fact-finding mission, we have identified at least 130 captives through videos collected from Azerbaijani social networks. In addition, we have collected data on other captives based on the testimonies of recently returned captives. In fact, Azerbaijan violated the agreement reached at the highest level as the parties agreed to return the POWs on an all-for-all -all basis. There are no Azeri captives in Armenia or Artsakh today, but Azerbaijan continues to hold Armenian captives in Azerbaijan. Moreover, the Azerbaijani side presents the Armenian uh, prisoners of war and civilian detainees as terrorists, declares that it has returned all the captives and uh, the issue of captives is closed. Azerbaijan that justifies its position by the fact that these people came under their control after the November 10th trilateral statement on ceasefire. This position of Azerbaijan, I think, is baseless for several reasons. The first is that not all the captives that currently are in Azerbaijan were ca uh, captured after November 10. Secondly, over 15 people from those who were captured after November 10 have already repatriated to Armenia and now, and uh, it is uh, a question how come some of them are terrorists and some are not. For example, Maral Najarian, a Lebanese Armenian citizen, uh, was captured on November 11 and returned by Azerbaijan a month ago. And finally, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is still ongoing international conflict. In fact, there should be no difference between those who were captured, captured before the ceasefire and those who were captured after. And if Azerbaijan presents them as terrorists, then uh, it treats them that way, meaning that Azerbaijan does not comply with the rules of international law protecting the rights of those people. 
a major obstacle to the return of prisoners of war and civilian captives and the protection of their rights is the fact that Azerbaijan is deliberately politicizing the process. Azeri's side manipulates this factor to put additional pressure on, on Armenia to gain more benefits in the negotiation process. Deliberately delaying the exchange is a part of psychological war that Azerbaijan uh, is implementing against Armenia. Video recordings showing Azeri abuse of power involving the execution and mutilation of Armenian captives are being widely posted to in, in order to humiliate not only the prisoners themselves, but uh, to, the, to their relatives, to the Armenian public as a whole. Uh, in my opinion, the legal mechanisms established by the international law somehow fail to address the issues of the protection of Armenian prisoners of war and civilian detainees and their return to the homeland. And the failure is not in the regulations because I think that regulations are, are perfect, but in the implementation of those rules. And, uh, and I think that international community needs to put more pressure on Azerbaijan in order to make Azerbaijan to fulfill its international obligations and to, to release uh, Armenian detained people. Uh, so this much about the information about the Armenian prisoners of war and civilian uh, detainees. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there, are, there will be questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stepanian, for sharing that really disturbing uh, information, which I'm sure many of us have seen reported. Um, and on that note, I'll turn now to uh, Jess Peake, who will talk about that and also start to move us towards the conversation of what kind of efforts can we undertake to bring the situation we're hearing more in line with the legal framework that uh, Julia expanded. Jess Peak is the Assistant Director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights and the Director of the International and Comparative Law Programme at UCLA School of Law. Jess teaches courses on the law of war and the war on terror and methods and theories of international and comparative law. And she recently received a grant to launch a human rights digital investigations lab at the Promise Institute in collaboration with colleagues at UC Berkeley in Santa Cruz. The Digital Investigations Lab launched in January and is working on a pilot project examining the role that online disinformation played in this conflict that we're discussing today, which will culminate in a report examining the failure of social media companies to stop the exploitation of the information space. Jess, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate, uh, and thank you, Gagam, for sharing your insights and to Julia for painting the picture of the legal landscape protecting prisoners of war under Geneva Convention 3 of 1949. My task is to try and connect these two things, and to do that, I'm going to rely heavily on reporting from human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch and also reputable news organizations. At we at the Promise Institute do not have direct knowledge of what the situation is on the ground, beyond, of course, hearing from our, mean, our Armenian community friends, many of whom are in this audience today. First, I just wanted to say something very briefly about the nature of this conflict. Undoubtedly, as Julia mentioned, the fall 2020 44 day war from September 27th to November 10th between Armenia and Azerbaijan was an international armed conflict. This means that it was a conflict between two states. And as Julia mentioned, in this situation, the whole range of protections under the Geneva Conventions, including Geneva Convention 3, which applies specifically to prisoners of war, applies. However, there was also likely a concurrent non-international armed conflict occurring between Azerbaijan and the Artsakh Defense Army during this war. Um, a non-international armed conflict, or a NIAC, occurs when there's fighting between a state and a non-state organized armed group within that state. And there are particular legal prescriptions for what constitutes an organized armed group under international law. And the Artsakh Defense Army meets those requirements. So as Julia told us, in the case of a non-international armed conflict, neither the category of prisoner of war nor that of combatant immunity exist, meaning that Geneva Convention 3 does not apply to those individuals, and they also may be prosecuted under domestic criminal law for their activities in the conflict. 
Um, I just wanted to mention that the rest of my remarks will address the particular situation of prisoners of war detained during the international armed conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan and the continued detention of Armenian nationals. But I just wanted to flag that additional complicating layer of the concurrent NIAC. I'm also not going to comment in these remarks on the detention of civilians that Gagam raised, but I'm happy to do that in the Q&A. So returning to the issue of prisoners of war, it is reported that Azerbaijan began detaining POWs in very early in the fall 2020 conflict with Armenia. However, Azerbaijan has never been forthcoming about the number of individuals detained. As we heard from Julia, Geneva Convention 3 requires parties to an international armed conflict to treat POWs humanely in all circumstances. In particular, Articles 17, 87 and 89 of Geneva Convention 3 prohibit torture and cruel treatment. Geneva Convention 3 also prohibits acts um, of violence or intimidation uh, against insults and public curiosity. Moreover, common Article 3, which means that it is featured in all three of the Geneva Conventions and actually is also applicable in a non-international armed conflict, prohibits cruel treatment and torture, and also outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. Azerbaijan is also bound by the absolute prohibition on torture and other degrading or inhuman treatment under Articles 7 and 10 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And as reporting from Human Rights Watch and other leading human rights organizations shows, Azerbaijan has failed to uphold its obligations of treatment of prisoners of war within their power. So the first report from Human Rights Watch I'm going to refer to was published in December of 2020. And in that, Human Rights Watch reported that Azerbaijan had inhumanely treated numerous ethnic Armenian troops captured during the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and had subjected them to physical abuse and intimidation. As Gegen mentioned, much of that abuse was captured on video and which was widely circulated on social media. And to quote the Human Rights Watch report, those videos depict Azerbaijani captors variously slapping, kicking and prodding Armenian POWs and compelling them under obvious duress and with the apparent intent to humiliate, to kiss the Armenian, uh, sorry, to kiss the Azerbaijani flag, praise, praise the Azerbaijani president and to declare that Nagorno-Karabakh is Azerbaijan. Human Rights Watch reported, as Gegem also mentioned actually, that in most of the videos viewed, the captors' faces are visible, suggesting that they didn't fear being held accountable for these actions. Um, and Human Rights Watch reported that they've closely examined 14 of these videos. This was actually done using open source investigation techniques that we are currently training our students in. And what that means is that you use various methodologies to attempt to verify the content of the video by matching various pieces of visual information with things you know to be true. These particular videos viewed by Human Rights Watch had been stripped of their metadata, so Human Rights Watch was not able to confirm the specific time and location. But Human Rights Watch is confident that none of these videos were posted anywhere online prior to October or November of 2020. And from this, they've been able to conclude their authenticity. Moreover, several of the individuals um, identified in the video have subsequently been identified by family members in Armenia as Armenian national combatants who had gone to fight in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And I will put links to all of these Human Rights Watch reports in the chat so you can read in much more detail um, the reporting on that. So then in a second more recent report from Human Rights Watch on March 19th of 2021, Human Rights Watch put out a more detailed report looking specifically at the abuse of Armenian POWs in Azerbaijani custody. For this report, Human Rights Watch interviewed four former POWs and Human Rights Watch reported that these individuals were captured under different circumstances and in, in different locations during the active fighting between October 15th and November 20th of 2020. These four individuals were actually returned to Armenia on December 14th and were among 44 POWs and civilians repatriated by Azerbaijani authorities on a special flight, which I'll mention more about in a, in a few minutes. So these four individuals in this report um, reported a, a broad range of abuses, including prolonged and repeated beatings, electric shocks, 
burns with cigarette lighters, uh, being prodded with sharp metal rods and given very little food or water. One reported, one individual reported that he was instructed to dig his own grave, which created severe mental anguish. All four reported that they were later transferred to the National Security Ministry detention facility in Baku, where they did receive food, water and medical treatment, but also said that they were beaten, suffered, suffered electric shocks and were forced to speak on camera, blaming the Armenian government for their plight, saying that they did not want to fight in the war and stating that Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. The four individuals interviewed said that these videos were fully scripted and given to them by their captors and that they were threatened with electric shocks if they didn't get it right. In this March 2021 report, Human Rights Watch concludes that Azerbaijan is violating its obligations under the Geneva Conventions and raised concerns that prisoners of war in Azerbaijan are at further risk. Human Rights Watch calls and continues to call on Azerbaijan to ensure that all POWs and others in their custody have the protections that they are entitled to under international humanitarian law and also under international human rights law, including freedom from torture and ill treatment. So along with the violations of Geneva Convention 3 that Human Rights Watch and others have reported, Azerbaijan is also in violation of the ceasefire peace agreement that was signed by Azerbaijan, Armenia and Russia on November 9th of 2020, which agreed to end the hostilities. Although that agreement is very brief and has been criticized for being brief, Article 8 of the agreement does provide for an exchange of prisoners of war and other detained persons and bodies of the deceased. So by failing to return POWs at the cessation of hostilities and continuing to detain them today, Azerbaijan is breaching one of the terms of the ceasefire. Both Armenia and Russia have an interest in ensuring that this part of the agreement is upheld. Um, so I wanted to also say something about the role of the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, with regard to the treatment of these POWs. In all conflicts, the ICRC is an independent, neutral organization ensuring humanitarian protection and assistance for victims of war and armed violence. Under the provisions of the Geneva Conventions, the ICRC is mandated to ensure that international humanitarian law is applied fully, including to those detained as POWs. The ICRC is empowered to visit prisoners, both military and civilian, to ensure that they are being treated humanely. And states are supposed to give the ICRC access to see all prisoners and internees falling within the ICRC's mandate, and the ICRC should have access to the places where they are held. The ICRC should be permitted to interview those interned and should be allowed repeat visits as often as necessary to ensure that internees are being treated in accordance with international standards. The ICRC also helps to connect detained prisoners with their family members and POWs detained should be able to write and receive letters from those family members. Um, understandably, the ICRC does not comment on ongoing situations, but we know from news reporting that Azerbaijan has not been particularly cooperative with the ICRC. We do know, however, that on at least some occasions, the ICRC representatives have been able to visit Armenian POWs in Azerbaijan. However, it appears that this access only came following intervention of the European Court of Human Rights. So let me talk for a moment about proceedings before the European Court of Human Rights regarding the interned persons. Several Armenian lawyers have brought cases before the European Court of Human Rights, and these have taken the form of interstate applications between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and also in many individual applications against Azerbaijan, all based on specific information about the treatment of detainees, which has been included, which we've seen in the video evidence of mistreatment that has circulated widely on social media. In these claims before the European Court of Human Rights, lawyers have raised human rights violations interpreting the European Convention on Human Rights in light of international humanitarian law, which is lex specialis in situations of armed conflict. In doing so, these claims are based on a number of human rights violations, including freedom from torture, the right to liberty, the right to be free from discrimination and uh, freedom of expression. There have been several requests for interim measures. Um, interim measures can be applied for under Rule 39 of the Rules of the European Court of Human Rights, 
and are urgent measures which may be granted by the court only when there is an imminent risk of irreparable damage. Um, the requests that were submitted, the interim requests that, that were submitted, argued that Armenian lives are under um, imminent threat in Azerbaijan, and the court has agreed and has ordered Azerbaijan to secure the lives and safety in uh, of Armenians in Azerbaijan, and also to provide information on the captivity and treatment conditions of those prisoners of war still held by Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, I mean, the, as a result of this, Azerbaijan did allow the ICRC to visit with some of those detained, but they have not been very cooperative on other fronts. Uh, and lawyers from Armenia are currently raising issues of non-implementation of the interim measures before the court. So what are the prospects for release of these POWs? Of course, as Julia explained, under Geneva Convention 3, prisoners of war should be released immediately. They have not. The first prisoner exchange took place in December of 2020, but Azerbaijan has not proved itself willing to be transparent about the number of detainees that it is currently holding. So there are a number of efforts ongoing, including international community pressure and potential submissions to other UN bodies to try and bring uh, Azerbaijan into compliance with its international obligations. And I'll leave it there, Kate, and we can get to uh, more detail in the Q&A perhaps. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think you left at exactly the right point. Um, I think the, the questions that are popping up in the Q&A, uh, understandably, are about you know, enforcement and accountability and what can be done. And maybe I'll ask all three of you. Um, I have a general question about what can be done in these situations. I also have a specific question asking whether third party states have any options. Um, so perhaps we could start with you, uh, Julia, to give an answer to that question. And then I don't know if, Gegum, you would want to talk about some of the actions that are being undertaken. And then maybe we can move to you, Jess, if you have anything to add at that point. OK, thank you, Kate. Um, I, I'll try to be brief on that topic of implementation uh, of IHL because, um, yes, IHL um, gives some provision uh, and uh, list a, a number of violations of IHL, but international humanitarian law has no monitoring uh, mechanism as such, nor a judicial body uh, that would be dedicated to IHL uh, violations. So what can we do? Uh, first of all, um, I, I think that uh, since the situation is still ongoing, what we need is a way to stop the violations before thinking about uh, prosecution for those who are uh, responsible for these uh, violations. And for that, we have a common article one to the four Geneva conventions, uh, which states that uh, the high contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions uh, must respect and ensure respect of the Geneva Conventions. And uh, while saying that the high contracting parties have to ensure respect, um, this means that there is a positive obligation on third states, so that's part of one of the questions uh, raised in the uh, Q&A um, section. Uh, so there is an, a positive obligation to do everything reasonably um, in their power to prevent or to bring uh, the violations to an end. So uh, the third states, uh, as um, parties to the Geneva Conventions, should implement this provision and should um, raise uh, the attention of Azerbaijan about uh, respect of the law uh, regarding the prisoners of war. Then um, about implementation, uh, that's about the criminalization of the violations of IHL. Um, uh, and on this, uh, we rely on um, the national law and for states that are a party to it, to the International Criminal Court, for example, but that's not the case now for Armenia, neither for uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, so we have to look at uh, national law. And also, um, and Jess, you uh, mentioned that, uh, torture and ill treatment, uh, and some of uh, the treatments reported by uh, human rights organization may amount to ill treatments or torture, uh, are grave breaches uh, under IHL. What does this mean? That means that um, these violations opens for universal jurisdiction. 
uh, and the, the, maybe the, the widest definition of universal jurisdiction uh, is uh, in the Geneva Conventions. Then under national law, there are some restrictions. So we have to look at all national law if we want to uh, use universal jurisdiction. But, um, and I will read maybe that's uh, the best thing that I can do. Each I contracting party shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to have committed or to have ordered to be committed such, such grave, grave breaches and shall bring such persons regardless of their nationality before its own courts. That means that if uh, someone uh, who is uh, accused of uh, having committed such violations is on the territory of, territory of any country, it should be prosecuted under IHR. Fantastic, Julia, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to highlight another uh, specific question in the Q&A, which either um, Gagan or Jess might want to address, which is whether Armenia can sue Azerbaijan in the International Court of Justice. There's also a question about whether Turkey can be held responsible in some way, perhaps through their membership of NATO. I don't know if any of you want to um, speculate on that, but Gagan, maybe you could briefly tell us about uh, initiatives that you know of that are underway. Uh, in addition, apart from the European Court of Human Rights cases, which Jess has already told us about. Yes, uh, there is a case, uh, Armenia against Azerbaijan, and uh, this case includes not only the treatment of uh, mistreatment of Armenian POWs by Azerbaijan, but also the whole range of uh, war crimes that the Azerbaijani side committed against the people of Artsakh, uh, including the uh, uh, deliberate targeting of civilian objects and civilian population, uh, the uh, 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 targeting of the cultural uh, objects of uh, Artsakh, uh, the violations of the, uh, and other viol violations of uh, the uh, rights of the people of Artsakh. And our institution is also participating in the fact-finding fact mission. And we regularly provide uh, the information, the data that we collect and we present to the representative of the Armenian Republic of Armenia to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Thank you very much. Um, Jess, is there anything um, you can add to the question? I can just say something briefly about the question about the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Um, as one of the most universally recognized human rights, the prohibition on torture has attained the status of a use kogans or peremptory norm of general international law, which gives rise to the obligation erga omnes, which means owed to and by all states, to take action against those who tortured. So. Possibly uh, the Armenia could bring a case uh, before the International Court of Justice, but it would be reliant on Armenia consenting to the jurisdiction of the court. And uh, we would be likely to run into some problems there, I think. Thank you very much. Um, Jess, I know I cut you off a little with the timing. I don't know if there was any parts of your um, presentation about accountability that haven't been raised yet. Uh, I was just going to mention that there may be some avenues to pursue before various UN Special Procedures mandates. Um, for example, submissions could be made to the UN Special Rapporteur on torture and other inhumane and degrading treatment, or possibly to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. There are perhaps other mandate holders that have competence to look at this issue. Uh, and so I, I, I understand that there may be some efforts underway already on that regard too, but I don't have further details on what that looks like at the moment. Thank you. And I just had a question come in, which I think might be related to what you were um, outlining, Jess, about whether organizations can file complaints on behalf of individual victims. Yeah, okay. Um, Yes, so there is a mechanism before the European Court of Human Rights where organizations can, f uh, can file on behalf of individual victims. Gegem is nodding, so perhaps he already knows of some efforts underway there too. Uh, you, I, I can bring examples of uh, from the 44 days war. Uh, during the war, uh, this function was mainly carried out by the human rights Armenian human rights organizations where they uh, were helping people 
uh, the relatives of, uh, of uh, for example, civilian uh, uh, killed people and uh, those civil civilian uh, detainees to feel the instead of them to feel the uh, case to the uh, inter, um, uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights. Yeah, they, there is a mechanism, and we use that mechanism during uh, our conflict. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we've reached uh, the end of our time. I want to thank the panelists very much for being here. Um, thank you, the new Ombudsman of the Republic of Artsakh. It was an honour to have you with us. Welcome and congratulations on your on your appointment and also on all the meticulous uh, human rights documentation that you and, and the team have been carrying out during the conflict. Uh, Julia, Professor Greenell, thank you so much for joining us from Quebec and sharing that fantastic legal overview. Um, Jess, uh, my colleague, uh, again, thank you very much for the um, interpretation of the accounts and your suggestions about move towards accountability. I'd remind everybody that um, Jess is working on this project, which is examining the social media um, during the war, the issue that was highlighted by Mr. Stepanian, and we hope to have a report on that at the end of the summer. Thanks everyone for joining Thank us. You. I think we had up to 100 attendees, so um, really delighted you made the time, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.